Thank you. Good morning. Glad to see you all here. I put together some images that have inspired me. So despite uh, what I say and yammer on about uh, at great length, uh, look at the pictures because they're worth a thousand words. And these are things that I've looked at and considered when uh, considering different things to do with, land, uh, with water in general. And uh, one thing that's important or a good point to remember is that rainwater is um, just water. Uh, we're looking today at rainwater, which is in the hydrologic cycle, precipitation. But I don't think we need to just focus on that. It's, rainwater is just the name of a particular point in time where water expresses itself falling from the sky, it concentrates, it flows, it erodes, and it goes through several different permutations before it does the whole thing all over again. So, um, and this has been going on for quite a while. Uh, so long, uh, in 1959, Beatrix Ferrand didn't even know that she was designing an evaporation garden when she designed the Pebble Garden at Dumbarton Oaks. Uh, and this is what I'm driving at is um, rainwater is water. You can use it as a resource, and there's beautiful ways to express it. And this used to be part of a fountain that was pumped mechanically. Uh, that system has long failed, but it's now rainwater that activates this piece of artwork. And uh, the same thing in the 17th century, the uh, Shah uh, Jahan uh, built this nice little memorial for his wife, uh, Montaz, and he also built an evaporation garden. So you can attach different uh, expressions to different parts of the hydrologic cycle. So this is just as effective as a bioswale, for example. It's just uh, a different Part. We're, we're focused on the precipitation. Well, this is also part of that natural cycle. As is this. This is a groundwater garden that uh, Richard Haig designed at the Bloedel Reserve up on Bainbridge Island. And uh, this is no different than the evaporation garden or a rainwater garden. This is a groundwater garden. And it's just using a different, it's defining expressions differently. Here's a ground spring in Brooklyn that uh, was long hidden um, by vegetation and things and was only recently discovered. And if we look at this in our perception as well, okay, <clears throat> that's, uh, gosh, is that a sewage overflow or, you know, it doesn't look so nice. Uh, shouldn't it be more precious than that in an urban environment? Is it the same thing as this? That I think we need to talk about uh, our, what our perception of water is, or stormwater, or rainwater, and that it's, that it's not just uh, something that's polluted and needs to be controlled and manipulated, but it needs to be revered and sanctified, and people's perspective on it needs to change in order to bring about a different approach to stormwater. That's what we're doing right here today, is changing our perception of what rainwater is, that it's not all bad stormwater, that not all rainwater erodes and creates floods, and so on and so forth, but that it's something we need to pay attention to and design around and design with. This is probably a 20s era. This is in Canton, Ohio, a way of expressing stormwater. This is all stormwater again. So it's, it's beginning, you're beginning to see an artful expression of stormwater. It looks like it could be pumped and recirculated and all that, but it's not. It's just stormwater. Similarly, in, uh, when you come to spaces between architecture and landscape architecture, water can be used as, it, as Carlos Scarpa did in the Brion Cemetery to sort of isolate architectural elements to sort of sanctify them by making islands of them, connecting structures, merging the architecture with the landscape. These are all important um, diff different ways of uh, putting meaning to water and giving, an, giving a special um, 
reverence for its presence. This is a baptismal, also by Carlos Scarpa. It just its form, the vessel that carries that water. Now, this is just water, but rainwater is just water, as is groundwater, as is evaporation, as is transpiration, as is vapor, as are clouds, snow, ice, and all of that. It's water, and here we're seeing how special something designed for it to try to give water a form adds to its meaning, uh, in this case for a cultural meaning, uh, religious meaning. It, it's holy water, as is this. It sort of drives the point home. This, uh, you know, was there a designer involved in this? Uh, does it really look holy? Does it look revered? It says holy water. Uh, but it only looks like a very devout plumber um, looked at this with interest. Uh, it's, it's interesting. If, if we actually uh, transpose the meaning of, of some, you know, this looks like everyday expression of water. It looks like a public drinking fountain. But if public drinking water was, did carry a meaning of sacredness or holiness, just think what we think about flooding waters in the Mississippi, that it's holy and revered and that it's renewing and replenishing our so, uh, soils and that it's uh, taking away bad things and bringing new and, and uh, we'd have a whole different perception. I, I don't know if that's making any sense or not, but you really have to look at how we perceive things. This is a Marcel Breuer designed for a baptismal as well. It's, so it's, Water gets meaning from the container and the way we handle it. The McIntyre Garden by uh, Lawrence Halpern in 1961 also handles water in a very interesting way. This could just as well be uh, water, uh, storm water, collected storm water. It could be runoff from this residence's driveway. Um, it's also an expression that is ephemeral. You could not have that water there and this design still comes through. So you can't have, uh, in fact, I was just in Washington, D.C. a few weeks ago and, and none of the fountains were functioning yet. And it's like, gosh, I never realized how many memorials were so dependent on water as an integral sacred element and should they not be designed where they aren't dependent upon that. Similarly, in Beijing, China, um, I, I worked on a project. Most every project you see there uses water as an organiz organizational element. So you have this 92 acres of housing and they're big residential blocks of apartments, but there's a spine of water that they like to sort of group things around because it is revered there a little bit more. I mean, it is seen as an essential life quality element. But, um, I thought it was also sort of uh, not very practical because there's water concerns in Beijing already. Um, and I, so I convinced them not to have that as an artificial water pumped, recirculated, treated feature, but to retreat and capture all the stormwater off their housing blocks and take it down into the central spine and have ephemeral bodies of water that when, were, when they were dry, they were usable, and when they were wet, they were features. Um, water is free. Rainwater is free. In Portland, rainwater is, or water is very expensive. I'm moving out to the country, so I get to go onto a well system where uh, rainwater, which I equate with, uh, or stormwater and, and uh, groundwater, is, uh, is cheap, it's just a, a pump away. Um, so I'm, I'm gaining a different respect for water and I think uh, until you design with it, try to manipulate water and understand its, its uh, myriad forms and expressions, um, until you, you try to grapple with that and you try to design with it and you screw up, then you start uh, respecting it. Even at 10th and Hoyt, the project you might be familiar with, we had to go back and retrofit some of the water features because it didn't move like I thought it would. And, and so you always have to model your, 
your projects. Uh, Herbert Dreisaitl is a great one for you know, full-scale mock-ups of his water expressions, and that's critical. Um, it also shows a little respect that water has power over your success or not. Uh, but you can also be a lot of fun. Uh, historically, people uh, have uh, made fun of it. They have uh, made it a little scary. Um, a little scary there. Rainwater. In Portland, there's an Ethos Cultural Music Center, and uh, they they have this wonderful downspout that actually moves and functions and generates a rotation that plays a, a music box inside this device. Um, going back to that, uh, it's, it's really no different. This is sort of a modern day Villa de Este water organ. If, if you're familiar with that, it's, it's all gravitational water running down through this garden that, that creates sound and, and uh, through a, a piping system that creates uh, an organ sound. And this is a modern day sort of Villa de Este in Las Vegas, the Bellagio, we all know that one. It's a little uh, too dependent upon solenoids. Uh, here's another expression that's uh, a scrim sort of a stage scrim and a backdrop to a social environment. Or maybe you need to catch it before it hits the ground. Here, this is in Mexico, the, I don't know if you know La Posas. It was uh, designed by Edward James in the 50s and 60s. And um, these are sculptural elements that mimic natural forms. Uh, but here you're catching water way up in the air, 20, 30 feet up, and you have aquatic plants up there, sort of artificial trees up in the air. Another great idea. So these are just different expressions and different ways you can mold and um, uh, play with stormwater. Or you can actually take the direct serious rainstorm runoff. This, this particular stream is ephemeral, depending on the uh, season. And it comes down, great waterfall, and uh, Edward James created this fantastical water display where it comes down and falls into pools and goes over weirs and runnels and gets collected and then moves on and down and splashes. And people come in here and play. And you can sort of see it's performing a duty here. You have the, that first base, and it's beginning to silt in. So, um, it, you can have that uh, sensual experience of actually being in that water, playing in it, swimming in it, but it's also collecting the sediment if it needs to be collected and, um, and creating a sort of a fantastical space. Uh, Paulo Soleri at Arc de Santi um, does something similar with great reverence. He's collecting the stormwater off the roof of some of these structures built in the 70s. And in this case, it comes falling off the roof, and there's sort of a water wheel element here that's missing, but it would rotate the, um, uh, the water wheel, and then it would go down to a cistern, and then it was actually piped, and the same stormwater would pop up in another part of the garden. So you have to play with these ideas. Uh, here in Arizona, doesn't rain all that often, but when it does, you want to activate it and make it sort of interesting and also c save it for use. Or in Dresden, there's uh, great things you can do with downspouts. Little whimsical, um, doesn't necessarily, it, it displays stormwater, doesn't obviously, uh, or apparently it doesn't uh, detain it a whole lot, so there's not a lot of uh, mitigation value there, but it's a certainly interesting display, as is this Buster Simpson up in Seattle, a lot of different downspout situations where little uh, pea traps collect enough water to sustain little bunches of, of um, sedge. But those were some of the ideas I went through in my mind. First of all, gosh, what is rainwater? Is it any different than any other type of water, which it really, it reacts the same way. You can manipulate it similarly. 
Is it anything special? Do you have to do anything special with it? And we had this project of a courtyard, and, and with the support of the architect, the prime architect, he, they really wanted to do something interesting uh, with the stormwater, so we decided to take all the roof, the 32,000 square feet of roof stormwater, and take it into this uh, 7,000 uh, square foot courtyard. So we looked at how to take the stormwater off, collect it on the roof, funnel it down, and do something fun with it. Well, I thought, hmm, how do you do that? It's not always raining in, in Portland. And, and if you make something that's activated by stormwater, then it's only activated, you know, some of the time. Maybe more, more often than in Phoenix, but still only some of the time. And how do you retain the interest of stormwater when it is flowing and keeping uh, interest for, for that space when it's not flowing? And what landscapes traditionally do the most with the least. And so I looked at Persian gardens that really collect uh, water in a very, uh, that's very uh, scarce at some seasons, and how they collect it using quanats and jubes and um, other devices. This is an aerial of, of underground hand digging, un underground aqueducts uh, that lead to these gardens on the edge of the Himalayas. And this is an example. So you have these, um, these uh, hand-dug tunnels from the foothills. All this stormwater comes down. It goes underground in porous soils, but they dig down to that water table, and they redirect the water to these gardens and run it through there. And sometimes it's just a trickle. Sometimes it's a river. And so I looked at what types of devices they use to exploit the lowest runs of water. This is a chadar that's used for low flows of water. It's scalloped like fish scales, but in, in uh, opposition to the water, so it activates the water. It turns it into white water. It makes a noise, a nice uh, shore sound, and it's also beautiful to look at. Then I looked at other devices like this where you have little niches where candles are put into the wall and uh, lit up at night, and you have sheets of water that fall over those candle niches. So you have backlit water, and then you have um, fountain sprays coming up in front of it. And it's like, hmm, that's, that's interesting. I could work with that. And that was some of the ideas that I started with um, for my ideas at 10th and Hoyt. This, I went to Morocco. These aren't from Morocco, these are off, off of Google, but I went to a, a little oasis out on the border of, um, out in the desert, in the Moroccan desert on the edge of the dunes, and you see all these different ways of irrigating uh, where water is precious. You know, they gather it, they have to concentrate it and collect it, and it's precious out there, so they have a reverence for it. So I started thinking about these runnels, and I made little concrete casts of various types of channels with different variations to try to piece them together and see how I could make uh, apply some of these ideas to Tenth and Hoyt. So um, these are actually some photos from the project, and you can sort of see here I did a 90-degree turn. And originally I just had this runnel here sort of budding into this runnel. Well, it was such a flow, and that's another thing, trying to calculate flow of water off a roof and the head that it gains while it's going down the downspout. Um, we had to add some precast pieces here so this water wouldn't shoot beyond the runnel. So you learn a lot about water dynamics. And then we have a low, fo low flow channel here. So high flow, we might have water flowing up to this point. Low flow, it gets concentrated at, um, in a smaller channel. So you can graduate the size of your devices. And you start, um, I guess that's going back to a Chidar. We looked at a larger sample. This is a full scale cast. I'd made this cast out of uh, the formwork out of foam core, half inch foam core. But it was to, to full scale to see how a person, a precaster, could precast a runnel uh, in a way. I had to simplify it, obviously, in the end. 
but it's a fun way to understand how to construct these things as well and what it takes. My plan was to set tiles on each one of those things to bring some color into it. And then we built models to try to uh, simulate the, the central downspout, um, the main downspout here, there's a downspout, there's one here in the corner and another one here. And how do you bring that into the space and still provide for circulation through it? And it's like mechanics and the cost, oh my God, you know, this is going to cost a, a lot. Um, I won't use my usual expression. Um, but it turns out that it doesn't take a lot. Uh, this, this, the cistern that we have uh, on the project, which I'll just pass this up here for a second. Uh, so this is the main downspout. It comes down, goes into a cistern that carries about 40,000 gallons. It's, this is all over a parking garage, keep in mind. Um, and uh, I'm not storing water because state health code would come after me. So I'm, it's actually an extended detention pond where I took a drill and drilled a Tom's laughing um, a little hole in the a stand pipe, the overflow flow pipe pipe. So technically this water is always moving and always draining out. Therefore I'm not collecting it. Therefore I don't have to clean it. I don't have to scrub it down with uh, detergents and I don't have to drain it to a uh, septic system. So uh, there are little ways you, you can get around some of the rules here. But anyway, this is a typical flow on a rainy day. Uh, it comes down. You keep it out of, uh, it is quite, a, it's about uh, three or four feet deep, that cistern. It's made out of cal caltite concrete, so it's a hydrophobic concrete mix. Um, and it's kept out of people's touch, so you don't have that issue to deal with from a state health code perspective. Um, and, and there's the, the final precast uh, Chadar thing, reminiscent of the Persian gardens. Another picture. A plan view, so there's the central thing, the cistern, and these are recirculating, so I have a very simple $139 float valve sump pump in the bottom of this cistern. It goes on when it rains, when you get enough water it turns on, starts recirculating. Uh, when the water drains down through that little piece size hole, uh, then it stops functioning. So an, it's an extended play sort of system. Here we have, uh, these are very shallow, filled with granite uh, river rock, very large ones, and they su uh, supply some detention, but they're my evaporation gardens. That's, this is an uh, extended version of uh, Beatrix Farron Pebbles Garden, Pebble Garden, where there's just a very shallow bit of water that sort of highlights the rock, the texture, the color, and then it overflows and into the other system. Now this isn't a completely 100% treated water. It's essentially a giant detention system. It's not for water quality. That's handled by conventional storm scepter filters in the, in the basement of the structure but that system could be downsized. So there was about a thirty dollars to $35,000 cost savings for this project because it, they didn't have to handle so much water at, at peak flows. Yeah. Time? Oh, boy. So anyway, here are some uh, photographs of the project. And I kept uh, the texture going and the planting going um, because it had to retain interest uh, during times that the rain wasn't flowing. And then I also used this idea from the Persian Gardens of backlighting some of these uh, fixtures. This is all Corten steel that's penetrated with glass buttons. And it creates, again, another type of Chadar system, borrowing from history. And it's still pretty well kept today. I think that's about it for my time. These are, more, uh, these are more recent photographs. Anyway, that's about it, I think. That's not fair. I think Tinth and Hoyt was a Trammell Crow project. It was Trammell Crow, but it was actually a partner developer that really pushed Trammell Crow to look beyond. What has been the response 
from the client or other clients, have people noticed and said, hey, I want one of those too, or have they basically ignored you? Uh, no, uh, the response has been good actually. The, the most important response from the developer's perspective, perspective was marketability. That there, this project gained so much interest from prospective apartment, this is an apartment building, not condominiums, but per, from prospective renters that um, they thought it was, it really um, improved their marketplace in a very competitive market. Um, also, we're currently, um, I mentioned um, that one of the criticisms was that those planters weren't flow through planters. Right now we're working on a project very similar to this, a lot of the same elements, but they will be flow through planters, so you have a total 100% stormwater treatment in a similar situation. So there's, so we're doing two things there. We're creating a better marketplace for the developer and then we're treating stormwater more diligently. Hmm. I just wanted to comment, Steve, on uh, the acoustical qualities of that space that you've oh. designed. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Oh, you want to talk about it? Um, I'd rather you talk about it. Uh, well, it, it, you always have interest. Uh, I think the great thing about water is that it, it's a very sensual thing to work with. You can feel it, you can smell it, you can hear it. And in that particular space, because of the uh, recycling of the rainwater, uh, you always have that sound of a, a little water feature happening there. And that in itself is inviting. You notice the plan was sort of a central courtyard or, or in a donut, and there's just a breezeway that goes through the building to get to this courtyard. And you really sense the water uh, auditorily as you pass by, and, you, and it draws you into that space. About you, I think you mentioned the, the recycling uh, element, but right. that it, it, at a certain point it drains down and, and no more water. Right. So what percentage of the year is there water that's active, would you say, versus not? In reality or in theoretically? In, in reality, yeah. There's always water there. Yeah, okay. So it's not an, I was going to ask if it was sometimes an issue that people think something's not working or right. they aren't affording No, something. what really happens is that little pee hole that I talked about, it somehow gets plugged up. <laughs> okay.